Good afternoon, church family. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ for another chapter and segment entitled Bathsheba. We're going to be looking at the second uh, Samuel text in the Word of God uh, this afternoon, uh, beginning with the 11th chapter. Uh, Bathsheba, certainly as we read uh, through this book, uh, she is often looked at as... Uh, a scandalous figure uh, in the Word of God. Uh, one of the, uh, and you may have uh, read this book, one of the bad girls uh, of the Bible. Uh, what's interesting uh, about this particular uh, chapter uh, entitled Bathsheba is Shannon Breen pushes against that and she gives us some some uh, context, some background that I think is very interesting that uh, really helps to kind of fill in the gaps to give us a, a larger picture about who Bathsheba is and certainly the position that uh, she was she was in. So I, I, I'm glad we are, are now in this chapter because I think it's it's necessary to kind of get get the bigger fuller picture here. So let me uh, do this. Let me uh, offer a word of prayer for us and then we'll we'll move right into this chapter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, oh God, all of your word, Lord, is important. As we get into these historical books of the Old Testament, Lord, as we move into uh, this particular book that uh, shares with us the life of Bathsheba, Lord, I, I, I pray that we can glean something, Lord, that is um, uh, your word uh, that gives inspiration and hope that gives uh, and in fact speaks to our own situation, Lord, in life. Lord, what a, what a wonderful miracle, Lord, your uh, word can be uh, this day and always. So guide us, Lord, direct us through your spirit. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, church, what I'd like to do is turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I want to begin with verse 3 here. This is about King David, Bathsheba, and Bathsheba's husband at the time, Uriah. Verse 3 here, it says this, So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone says, Is that not Bathsheba? the doctor of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Now let me stop there. So that, that gives us uh, kind of a door in to what uh, the larger uh, context is, is that uh, David uh, sees Bathsheba. She is uh, bathing uh, herself. He sees that immediately. He is attracted to this woman immediately. He wants to know uh, who she is and, and more about her. So he, he makes the summons here. So, so let me just give a, a little more uh, detail to that background here. I'm going to pages 110 and 111 of our book here uh, ju just, to, just to give us some, some better clarity here. Uh, in 2 Samuel, of the 23rd verse here. We find that David knew plenty about Bathsheba's husband. Uriah the Hittite was part of an elite band of 30, in quotes here, chief warriors who protected David and fought on his behalf. We don't know how a Hittite came to be one of the king's most trusted officers and a loyal soldier of Israel, but it might have had something to do with Bathsheba. Did Uriah convert to the Jewish faith because he fell in love with her? It is probable that Uriah was not the name that he was born with, because Uriah is a Hebrew name meaning the Lord is my light. Whoever he was, we know that Uriah had made a choice to be who and where he was, and presumably Bathsheba was a part of that choice. 
Despite his personal relationship with Uriah, David showed zero hesitation when provided with the details about Bathsheba. Now going to verse, verse 4 of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, it says this, Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now, page 111, some, some other information that I think is important to the text here. And I quote, But put yourself in Bathsheba's shoes for a minute. She's been summoned. He has seen her naked. She was a military wife. Maybe she thought there was news about Uriah. Her heart must have been in her throat as she hurried to the palace, apprehensive about what news awaited her there. Imagine her response when it turned out the news was that King David wanted to sleep with her. Was she flattered? Was she terrified for herself? For the price her loved one might pay if she refused. The Bible doesn't tell us much, and we don't fully know what her options were in this situation. But it is clear that David the king was far more responsible, listen to this, for the sinful fling than the woman who was his subject. We're told Bathsheba returned home after David had what he wanted. She soon learned that she was pregnant and then sent word to the palace. At this point, King David held all the cards. I wonder how frightened Bathsheba must have been in those agonizing days and weeks, realizing she was carrying a child who was clearly not her husband's, and she could have been stoned, in fact, for adultery. Uriah would have been justified in casting her aside completely. Unwilling to take responsibility for his own sin, David decided to add to his growing list of transgressions. So what does David do? He plots, right? He plotted to bring Uriah home from the battlefront in hopes that the brave warrior would sleep with his wife and believe the child to be his own. So David sent word to his top commander, Joab, send me Uriah. The Hittite, that's from 2 Samuel 11, 6. And once Uriah arrived at the palace, David warmly greeted him and then sent him home to Bathsheba with a gift. Now I'm turning to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 9. Listen to this. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all of his master's servants and did not go down to the house. Now here's where it gets interesting. David's got a problem now. Knowing his plan was crumbling, the king called in Uriah to explain why he didn't go. 2 Samuel 11, 11 says this, Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Ju Judea are staying in tents, and my commander Joab, my lord's men, are camped in the, in the open country. How can I go to my house to eat and drink? and make love to my wife. As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Second Samuel 11, 11. Interesting tidbit here. Now here's where the scholarship helps. Many scholars who study this time period say the army would likely have been under strict protocols during uh, this battle season, this battle campaign, to remain abstinent. Even though Uriah was brought to his beautiful wife and the comforts of home, he refused to compromise his integrity. David compelled him to stay another day and even got him drunk that night. Still, though, Uriah resisted whatever pull he must have experienced to go to his own house. This is yet another inflection point. David had slept with someone else's wife, impregnated her, and then hatched a ruse to make her husband believe the child was his. Enough cars had piled up onto the growing wreckage, right? 
But there's nothing in Scripture that suggests David even thought about confessing and beginning a cleanup mission. Instead, he sent his loyal warrior, Uriah, away, carrying his own death warrant. Interesting. Interesting. So, with this information that, that's being shared, both in the scriptures and, and also uh, by Shannon here, uh, let, let, me, let me just ask you this simple question, okay? What you knew about Bathsheba, about this story, uh, has, uh, have these details, um, has this uh, commentary, this scholarship, uh, changed your thinking uh, about Bathsheba. Anyway, has this changed your thinking about David, right? Okay. Uh, just a couple of things here. Number one, um, as I had uh, mentioned in last week's sermon about David, uh, a man after God's own heart. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. Was he sinful? Yes. You know, w was he seeking redemption for his wrongs, for his sinful life. Absolutely. This is a, a, a very, very real and explicit example of that. Uh, his plotting, his treachery, and that's, that's what we see, you know, throughout Throughout this uh, entire book, I, I, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's very real, it's very human, because we have fallen, sinful people, ultimately, that have been chosen, right, for, for God's kingdom, for God's glory. B but let's not gloss over the fact that they are what they are, and that is sinful and fallen here. And, and we see the direct results of sinfulness and fallenness and that's why that's why church you and I that's why we all need a redemptive grace-filled God to lead us to guide us to show us the way to his son Jesus Christ wow what what an intense story the, the, these, these chapters, uh, Elizabeth and Mary, Rebecca, just going back just for a minute, uh, Ruth and Naomi, uh, Jacobed and Miriam. Um, folks, the, these are, these are r real people, you and I, real people going through the trials of life, going through a real tribulations. Some of them are uh, by our own doing, of course. Some due uh, to circumstance. But wow, wow. Let, let the scriptures speak to you in this way. That's why we need a redemptive God. So um, David is plotting. We will see the uh, direct the end result of him plotting uh, against Uriah, uh, and, and certainly the the direct results of that. But just be be thinking about your thoughts about David, uh, about Bathsheba, and what we now know about them. The detail shared here has that changed your thinking about them? Maybe you're a David. Maybe you're a Bathsheba, okay? Are you in need of redemption? Have you come to peace, come to terms, come to uh, 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 reconciliation, come to a better understanding of forgiveness with God? Or have you been holding on to all of these things, just trying to sweep them under the carpet or run away from them? Maybe the time is today that you make peace with the Savior. Think about that. It's worth putting it to prayer. It's worth being free of the bondage that holds us back from God's grace and his forgiveness. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, your word, it is alive, it is a well, it is spirit 
filled, O oh God. Guide us, Lord, always. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you are uh, the advocate, Lord. So guide us, Lord, down that righteous path. But it is so easy, Lord, to get off the righteous path and get onto a destructive path. So many ways in which we can self-destruct ourselves. Lord, the enemy is in the midst of it. The enemy, O oh God, Lord, uh, wants to get us off path. Scripture says, uh, though, that there will be trial, uh, but take good cheer. It says, Jesus Christ has conquered the world. So do we want to associate ourselves with someone who's going to take us down a destructive path or someone who is going to take us across the victory line? Lord, let us go always with the one who is victorious, Jesus Christ. There is always, always, always an opportunity, Lord, always an opportunity for forgiveness, for redemption. And we know that, Lord, in our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. So church, we will continue uh, next week with the book of... Bathsheba uh, in uh, the mothers and the daughters of the Bible speak and we will uh, continue to go through that chapter and glean uh, some highlights and some perspectives. So you have a wonderful and God blessed day. Take care. Bye-bye.